Hello, this is the Daily Report for Friday, March 11th. The number of COVID-19 fatalities here in the country has hit a record high. We start with pandemic-related news. Here are the global tallies with our Kwonsoa. So let's start here in Korea then. Sure, Sunny. So uh, despite the rise in fatalities, the number of infections this Friday has dropped to below 300,000. And uh, that's uh, still in the high 200,000s, though, as you can see here. And it includes uh, 282,888 domestic transmissions. And uh, the number of imported cases has uh, gone up to above 100. And uh, if we go over to our graph, we do see that the numbers have dropped from the two days before when we had over 300,000 cases. However, that might also be due to fewer testings around Election Day. And if we compare this figure to last Friday, it is still an on-week increase. And uh, if we now move over to our map, uh, we see that Gyeonggi-do province still is seeing the highest number of infections at above 72,000, followed by more than 56,000 in the capital's Seoul. Also, places like Busan and Gyeongsang Namdo province have reported more than 20,000 infections in the past day. And uh, now on to the number of uh, deaths. Uh, 229 people have lost their lives in the past day, uh, marking an all-time high. With that, the death toll stands at 9,875. And the number of patients in severe or critical condition has been at above 1,000 for the fourth straight day, rising slightly from the day before to 1,116. And let's also take a check on the vaccination figures. Around 5,000 people and more than 6,000 have received their first or second dose of COVID-19 vaccination. And on to the booster shots, uh, we've got a little under 60,000 people who uh, have been administered with a booster shot on Thursday. And that's now equivalent to 62.3% of the nation's population. Let's take a look at the global COVID-19 infections, a rise by a little under 1.9 million cases in the past day as of noon Korea time with a little over 7,300 COVID-19 related fatalities. And uh, meanwhile, Germany has posted an all-time high on Thursday local time here now at 16.6 million uh, infections in total, reporting over 260,000 cases. And uh, you can also see that South Korea with 5.8 million cases uh, has moved up a few spots uh, when it comes to the accumulated caseloads in the world. And uh, those are the general updates I have for now, but I'll see you back in a bit. Sunny? All right, so I'll thank you for the global tallies over the past 24 hours. Now, for more coverage of the local COVID-19 situation, I have Choi min -jong in the studio with me. min -jong, welcome back. Thank you for having me, Sunny. All right, so let's start with the tally for this Friday and the prospects ahead, min -jong. Sunny, Korea has seen a slight dip in the number of COVID-19 infections on Friday with the figure coming under the 300,000 mark. But authorities are bracing for an even bigger surge in the coming days. Prime Minister Kim bu gyum said a, in a morning briefing that Korea's Omicron peak is expected to arrive within the, within the next 10 days and that our daily case counts could reach as a high as 370,000. The government has announced new changes in our testing protocols as part of efforts to prepare itself for the upcoming surge. Let's take a listen. From next week, officials will approve rapid antigen test results provided by professionals as being official, even without results from PCR tests. Literally, it will be a rapid test, which will allow us to preemptively prevent further infections. This only applies to rapid antigen tests carried out by trained medical professionals at hospitals and local clinics and does not include self-testing conducted at home. So who, those who test positive from rapid antigen testing will have to isolate and receive treatment right away without taking a separate PCR test. This after health authorities found that people who tested positive from a rapid antigen test also got a positive result from follow-up PCR testing between 90 and 95 percent of the time. Authorities say there are many benefits to the simplified testing procedure as it could reduce delays in prescription and treatment that have resulted from people awaiting their PCR test results. Right, and Min Jung, talking about treatment, COVID-19 patients here in the country are now allowed to receive medical care at regular hospital wards. Tell us about that. 
right, the government has decided to allow patients already in hospital with mild COVID-19 symptoms to be treated in regular wards. This way, hospital beds can be used more efficiently for COVID-19 patients with more severe illnesses who need intensive medical care. Infected patients will also be allowed to undergo surgery in regular operating rooms. And no extra charges will apply for hospital patients who are also being treated for COVID-19. The measure has already been adopted by several medical centers, including Seoul National University Hospital, and there have been no reports of new infections as a result of this move. I see. And finally, Aminja, what's the latest with regard to Omicron within the academic arena? Right. Despite the rapid surge of Omicron, most schools nationwide are still holding in-person classes. According to the Prime Minister, children are attending physical classes in more than 97% of schools nationwide. This includes students in kindergarten, elementary, middle and high schools. Out of the total number of school children, 82% of them are taking in-person classes. But concerns are still mounting over the alarming surge in student infections. Cases among children aged 18 and under currently make up one quarter of our new infections, and this comes despite almost 80% of minors aged 13 to 18 being fully vaccinated. But authorities said the vaccination rate for the young is still relatively low than that of adults, which is currently at 96%. Against this backdrop, the Education Ministry on Friday has decided to allow the use of saliva-based PCR testing for students. This is over concerns that regular PCR testing can be a painful and terrifying experience, especially for young children. I'm sure it can, Minjung. I'm sure it can. Now, let's in expand our talk to include Soa. Soa, Minjung mentioned Prime Minister Kim bo quite a couple of times in her delivery. I believe it was a week ago when you shared with us his COVID-19 infection. Right. Uh, the Prime Minister tested positive for COVID-19 last Thursday. And because of that, uh, he did not go to work starting on Friday. Uh, so he wasn't seen in public since then. And after his seven-day quarantine period has ended, he now presided over that briefing that Minjung earlier mentioned. So expressing his apologies to the public that he contracted the virus as a public official, he also spoke about his own experience while being treated at home. Given his age, he was monitored twice a day, he said, which is the process for patients aged 60 and above who recover at home. During the process, Kim said he realized how people that are not being monitored could feel anxious. With that, he vowed to thoroughly review this system for regular at-home treatment patients that need consultation in case they experience changes to their condition. The Prime Minister also thanked the nation's people for cooperating in the unprecedented presidential election that was held amid surging COVID-19 cases in a safe and orderly manner and promised the incumbent government will do its best in protecting citizens' health until the end of the administration with no loopholes in virus measures. Good to know, of course. By the way, Min Jung, do we have any details on the incoming administration's COVID-19 strategy? Well, Sunny, nothing is certain right now, but we are getting the sense that President-elect Yoon will be lifting some of the current measures. Yoon has been critical of restrictions on businesses like restaurants and cafes, stressing that small business owners must be fully compensated for all their losses. He said the matter will be discussed in the Presidential Transition Committee, and around 50 trillion won or around 40 billion U.S. dollars will be injected to support owners hit hard by the pandemic. Pundits say that social distancing measures, as well as restrictions on business hours, are also likely to be lifted. And what's also being anticipated is the possible lifting of outdoor mask mandates, uh, with more flexibility being given to outdoor masking rules as well. And uh, you're probably um, talking about more flexibility in indoor uh, conditions as well. And uh, also the lifting of outdoor mask rules was actually already introduced uh, here in Korea way back uh, before we have been dealing with the Delta and the Omicron wave. So if we do pass uh, the peak of the Omicron wave, it could be a possibility again. And uh, just like in other countries. Uh, speaking of other countries, uh, Brazil is gradually lifting its mask mandates due to a slowing number of infections and deaths, as well as higher vaccination rates. According to Brazil's health ministry on Thursday local time, out of 27 major cities, 11 have suspended their outdoor mask requirements. In four of them, including Rio de Janeiro, masks are not even mandatory in enclosed spaces. 
The U.S., uh, which has or is expected to lift mask mandates across all states, is now looking for another step forward in bringing back pre-pandemic lives as the CDC is drafting a guidance to ease mask rules on airplanes, trains, buses and other means of mass transit. However, the requirement of wearing masks on public transportations that was to end on March 18th has for now been extended to April 18th. Back on the domestic front, so I understand border controls here will be eased. Right, Sunny. So starting on March 21st, uh, fully vaccinated people entering the country will be exempt from a mandatory quarantine period. Now, currently, everyone, regardless of their vaccination status, has to isolate for a seven day period. And uh, here is an official at uh, the earlier government briefing on what fully vaccinated entails. Those who received second doses of a WHO-approved vaccine, including Novavax shots, between 14 and 180 days ago, and those who got their booster doses are considered fully vaccinated. Quarantine exemptions will be provided starting on March 20th for those who registered their vaccination status on the COOP system, whether they got their vaccines here or abroad. Starting on April 1st, uh, people who have been inoculated overseas but haven't recorded their vaccination status have to put in their vaccination information in a pre-registration system to get exempt from quarantine. However, the isolation rule is, is expected to remain for people who arrive from high-risk countries, which for now are Pakistan, Uzbekistan, Ukraine and Myanmar. Meanwhile, also beginning in April, the operation of so-called quarantine taxis and special seats on KTX bullet trains will stop, meaning all entrants can use regular public transportation while, of course, abiding by basic prevention measures like thoroughly wearing their face masks. And uh, also regarding mandatory testings for entrants uh, from abroad, uh, there's been a slight change. Now, earlier, uh, we had to have a person person get tested for COVID-19 before uh, they depart and also on the first day upon arrival and uh, between the sixth and seventh day after they enter the country. So a total of three PCR tests had to be done. But uh, since yesterday on Thursday, the last test can be replaced by a self antigen test. And uh, meanwhile, the government is also uh, going to closely watch for any potential new variants abroad after they do relax these measures. Right. So good to know. Thank you for the updates. Min Jung, thank you as well. Thank you. Russia may resort to the use of biological or chemical weapons in Ukraine. This is according to the Ukrainian leader following rampant allegations by Kremlin about related biological activities by Kiev with the help of Washington. Shin Yun explains. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky has dismissed Russia's allegations that Kiev was developing biowarfare laboratories. Russia has repeatedly accused Ukraine of working with the U.S. to develop biological weapons. In a televised address on Thursday, President Zelensky shared his concerns that Russia's accusations were actually the groundwork for Moscow to prepare deploying chemical weapons in Ukraine. This makes me really worried because we've been repeatedly convinced. If you want to know Russia's plans, look at what Russia accuses others of. The United States and the UK agreed. Both countries shared concerns that Moscow was preparing to use a chemical or biological weapon against Ukrainians. Over the past few days, Russia has been at the center of international criticism for targeting civilians. Especially after three people, including a young girl, died from an apparent Russian airstrike at a children's hospital in Mariupol. While Moscow has denied all claims, the UN Human Rights Office said at least 549 civilians have been killed and another 957 wounded since Russia invaded some two weeks ago. The international body said real figures could be considerably higher. A Ukrainian parliament official, speaking of civilian casualties on Thursday, said at least 71 children had been killed. But the war seems far from stopping yet. 
A U.S. defense official reported Russian troops advancing from the northwest part of Ukraine's capital are now just 15 kilometers away from the city center. To lessen civilian casualties, though, U.N. spokesman Stefan Dujeric on Thursday called for the need for safe passage and humanitarian supplies. Moscow on Thursday said it will open daily humanitarian corridors from 10 a.m. local time to evacuate civilians fleeing in Ukraine to Russian territory. Kyiv responded saying no such corridor should be linked to Russia. Shin Yeun, Arirang News. Meanwhile, in a move that is widely considered quite uncharacteristic, Seoul and Washington have made public details about Pyongyang's most recent missile test launches. Pyongyang tells us why. South Korea and the U.S. announced Friday that North Korea's two latest ballistic missile launches on February 27th and March 5th appear to be related to testing its new intercontinental ballistic missile system that was first displayed at a military parade in October 2020. Seoul's defense ministry said intelligence agencies from South Korea and the U.S. assessed that the two launches did not demonstrate full ICBM capabilities in terms of range. But it said they were likely intended to test elements of the new system before a maximum range launch is conducted. The defense ministry added that it strongly condemns launches that violate U.N. Security Council resolutions and raise tensions on the Korean Peninsula. Disclosing information such as this is very rare as normally neither South Korea or the U.S. unveil details of North Korea's missile launches. U.S. Pentagon spokesperson John Kirby said in a statement that the decision was made because the international community must speak in a united voice to oppose the further development of such weapons by the North. He also noted that U.S. forces in the Pacific have stepped up surveillance activities in the West Sea and ordered enhanced readiness among missile defense forces in the region. A U.S. official speaking on condition of anonymity said Washington will be imposing a new round of sanctions on Pyongyang. The official said the government will announce new actions on Friday to help prevent North Korea from advancing its weapons programs, and that this will be followed by a range of further actions in the coming days. But despite international criticism and calls to return to talks, the North, while insisting that it's speeding up efforts to develop reconnaissance satellites, appears to be developing long-range missiles. The North state-run news agency said Friday that its leader Kim Jong-un visited the regime's satellite launch site and ordered the expansion of the launching facility that is capable of firing intercontinental ballistic rockets. Kim visited the Sohae satellite launching ground, which has been used to put a satellite in orbit. But the same facility can also be used to conduct various tests involving technology that requires similar to that used in ICBMs. He called for its modernization so that various rockets can be launched to carry multi-purpose satellites. Peunji, Arirang News. On the economic front, Korea's current account remains in the black, but the surplus is smaller in size compared to a year ago. Kim Sung-min has more. South Korea saw a current account surplus for the month of January, but the size of that surplus was smaller compared to the same period last year. According to the Bank of Korea on Friday, the country posted a 1.8 billion U.S. dollar current account surplus in the first month of this year. While that was the 21st straight month of surplus, the figure was down almost $5 billion on year. That's because imports grew faster than exports in January amid soaring oil and raw material prices. Exports increased by roughly 20 percent in January from a year earlier, but imports jumped by around 34 percent. Extending the growth in exports for the 15th straight month in January were petroleum products jumping 87 percent, as well as the country's key exports like steel products almost 40 percent and semiconductors 24 percent. In total, exports came to around 56 billion U.S. dollars. South Korea's imports came to around 55 billion dollars, largely due to the skyrocketing energy and raw material prices. Crude oil imports jumped almost 87 percent on-year and gas 187 percent. The service account, which includes outlays by South Koreans on overseas trips, improved but still saw a deficit of $450 million. Within the service account, the transport account logged the biggest surplus on record at $2.32 billion and is soaring freight rates and recovering demand for shipments. Despite growing uncertainties coming from the war in Ukraine, the BOK said its outlook for February's current account balance remains positive. Kim Sung-min, Arirang News. 
And much to the delight of fans worldwide, BTS is back on stage here in Korea starting Thursday night. The group's second show on Saturday will be shared at movie theatres in about 60 nations. Here's Kim hyo -sun. Their first in-person concert in front of Korean fans in over two years. BTS made a triumphant return to the stage at Seoul's Olympic Stadium on Thursday, kicking off their first of three shows as part of their Permission to Dance on Stage tour. We used to film our performances just putting cameras in front of empty seats. However, with the army in front of us, we are so touched and excited. Fans were not only required to wear face masks, but were also prohibited from cheering, screaming or singing along. As we've been waiting for this moment for ages, I hope everyone follows the anti-coronavirus measures properly and are happy. I love you, BTS. While the venue can handle up to 70,000 people, attendance was limited to just 15,000. Nevertheless, this was the largest in-person audience in South Korea since the onset of the pandemic. Thursday's concert was also streamed live for fans who could not make it to the actual show. BTS will perform two more shows in Seoul on Saturday and Sunday, with Saturday's concert to be broadcast at movie theaters in some 60 countries. Following their shows in Seoul, the group traveled to the U.S. for in-person concerts in Las Vegas in April. Kim Hyo-san, Arirang News. In this week's International Focus, we turn to neighboring Japan, where the pandemic situation appears to be abating as authorities there seek to better respond to international matters, including the bloodshed over in Ukraine. I have Walter Sim live on the line. Walter, it's good to have you on. Thanks for having me. Right, Walter, let's begin with a few words on Japan's on the Japanese media coverage of Korea's presidential election. Sure. Well, all in all, the mood has been very positive, and, and I think Japanese media, as well as the government, sees this presidential election as a chance to hit the reset button after, you know, ties between Japan and South Korea basically chilled under the outgoing president Moon Jae-in. Um, I do think that, you know, the clear preference amongst Tokyo bureaucrats was for a more predictable conservative government and, and it was also under the last conservative government that the comfort woman deal was struck in 2015 and, and so I, I think this has contributed to an overall positive atmosphere uh, over the outcome of the election. Right and Walter, Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida has congratulated President-elect Yoon suk yeol on his victory and has added hopes for better bilateral ties. What do pundits that in Japan believe is necessary perhaps to set up a constructive relationship? Well, that's a very difficult question um, because, you know, pundits here in Japan, as well as government diplomats, really believe that the ball is in South Korea's court to offer solutions to issues that have cropped up over the last five years, such as a South Korean court rulings to seize assets of Japanese companies over their role in wartime labor um, 70 years ago. And so it really remains to be seen how Mr. Yoon will approach this, given that, you know, he is a political and diplomatic novice. So um, Japan, in a way, well, there's no better way to put this, but I, I think a lot of Japanese politicians think that South Korean politicians have sought to tap all these historical grievances to, you know, score political brownie points when their approval ratings fall. And so there are concerns here in Japan that, you know, Mr. Yoon's agenda might well be hamstrung by political infighting given how divisive the election was. But Nonetheless, there are still some uh, bright sparks and, uh, and there are hopes that, you know, ROK will work more closely with Japan, as well as the United States on such issues as North Korea, as well as to promote regional stability. Some Japanese experts are also wondering if, you know, South Korea might prove to be a valuable partner for Quad, as well as the free and open Indo-Pacific uh, framework that Japan has been spearheading this, uh, all these years. Right. Walter, moving on to the pandemic front, I hear, like I mentioned earlier, the COVID-19 situation in Japan appears to be improving. Am I right? 
Yes, uh, it has been stabilizing, and some um, experts here in Japan say that, uh, you know, um, Japan has been past the Omicron, Omicron peak. Uh, even though one area of concern is that the number of serious cases as well as the daily death toll remains quite high. Um, yesterday, there were about 60,000 cases nationwide, uh, whilst the quasi-emergency remains in place in 18 prefectures, including Tokyo and Osaka, until March 21st. Um, but that said, um, I think the government is coming to a realization that it is untenable to keep, you know, these curbs going indefinitely. Uh, and some reports are now stating that Prime Minister Kishida's government is thinking of lifting restrictions, even if the case load remains high, as it starts to treat COVID-19 as an endemic a disease. Uh, we also see some signs of this and how Prime Minister Kishida has uh, moved to reopen borders quite rapidly after Japan came under serious criticism worldwide over its isolationist policy. Um, so Japan will now allow in as many as 100,000 foreign students by May and this pace I think is really unthinkable just weeks ago. Right, there would be 100,000 foreign students from about 7,000 is it this week then? Well, it the quota for uh, foreign students is separate from the daily quota of 7,000 arrivals a day. So I think, uh, you know, Prime Minister Kishida is really going to accelerate, you know, allowing foreigners to enter uh, going forward. I see. Walter, meanwhile, on the international front, I believe Japan has been quick to respond to Russia's violent campaign over in Ukraine with punitive measures. Could you tell us a bit more about that? Yes, indeed. Uh, and, and Japan has done a lot of things uh, by working pretty much in lockstep with its partners in uh, uh, uh its partners in the G7. So it has imposed sanctions on Russia and Belarus. And it's also offered to take in Ukrainian refugees. And uh, I think in a very notable and very rare move this week, it sent a plain load of non-lethal military equipment, such as bulletproof vests and helmets to frontline fighters in Ukraine. Now, this is significant because of Japan's pacifist stance since World War II. And, and so I, I think this uh, opens the door for Japan to you know, play a more proactive role in supporting friendly forces and other conflicts going forward in future. Uh, now, Japan's corporate sector has also taken part in an, a widening global boycott. So we see companies like Uniqlo, like Nintendo, Sony and Hitachi saying that they would suspend operations or sales in Russia. But uh, that said, it might also be worth looking at what Japan has not done um, to see the you know delicate balancing act that Japan is facing. Firstly, it has not stopped imports of Russian oil and LNG because this is going to hurt its own energy security is a resource poor country. It's worth noting that you know the United States as well as other G7 countries have said that they would stop imports of Russian um, energy supplies. And so Japan's move, I think, stands out on this front. Um, companies like Mitsui and Mitsubishi have not joined uh, its other counterparts like BP and Shell in pulling out of Russian energy projects as well. Right. And Walter, finally, today, that is March 11th, marks the 11th anniversary of the nuclear nightmare in Japan's Fukushima region. Now, since then, regional authorities that in that region have pledged to forge a renewable future with all energy needs to be met by clean power by the year 2040, I believe. How far have they come? Well, they have moved forward on this very quickly and, and Fukushima really is rebranding itself as a renewable energy as well as a robotics hub under the so-called Fukushima Innovation Coast Framework. There's a Fukushima hydrogen research field in the region which basically provided uh, hydrogen power that fueled the Olympic Village in in the Tokyo Olympics last year. So uh, as, as far as the fact that, you know, solar panels and wind power plants really dot the Fukushima coastline these days. So I think that is political will in Fukushima to put um, the actions where the, uh, where the words are. Uh, and, and infrastructure development as well uh, is nearly complete in the region. We see new roads, new railways, new uh, expressways, for instance. But that said, however, uh, I, I do think that the reconstruction efforts have been quite complicated in other aspects. So just to spotlight a couple of issues in the interest of time. Um, so first, there are efforts to you know, overcome so-called harmful rumours that Fukushima brands as the fourth disaster after the earthquake, tsunami and nuclear disaster. And Fukushima produce exports are actually now at pre-disaster levels. Uh, uh, 
in, in, in data that uh, Fukushima provided. But yet a plan that the IAEA has endorsed to release water from the crippled Fukushima Daiichi plant is causing a lot of unease amongst the locals, despite the IAEA stressing that you know the water will be treated to remove all radioactive substances except the harmless tritium, which itself is a routine byproduct of nuclear plants worldwide. Um, the IAEA also says that the water will be diluted to one fortieth of the allowed tritium limit before discharge. But you know, locals fear that the what all, all this uh, hard data means nothing if the authorities fail to convey this sense of trust and safety, given how subjective and primal emotions are. Um, there's also a, uh, there's also a, in, in a sense, a spat uh, by Prime Minister Kishida against you know former Prime Ministers Junichiro Koizumi and Naoto Kan, who are now prominent anti-nuclear lobbyists. After the two ex premiers, you know, uh said that uh, many children are suffering from thyroid cancer due to the nuclear disaster. Prime Minister Kishida uh, said that, you know, this is fake news, this is false information. But I think this also goes to show, you know, how primal emotions remain 11 years after the tragedy. And there's a new lawsuit fought by six people who were minors when the nuclear accident happened. They now suffer from thyroid cancer, though they do not have a family history of the disease. Japan insists that the accident has not caused any health Related problems, but I think whichever way the the lawsuit is ruled, I, I think the verdict will send reverberations throughout Japanese society. Right, it certainly seems that way, Walter. All right, then as always, Walter, thank you very much for the latest from neighboring Japan. Thank you very much. In our panel session on this Friday, we address the possible diplomatic and security blueprint of the incoming administration as it seeks to address the changing global order. For more, I have Professor Min Jong-hun from the Korean National Diplomatic Academy. Professor Min, welcome back. My pleasure. I also have Dr. Ko Myung-hyun from the Asan Institute of Policy Studies. It's been a while, Dr. Ko. It's good to be back. Right, meanwhile, joining the session virtually is Dr. Patrick uh, Cronin at the Hudson Institute over in Washington, D.C. Dr. Cronin, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you. Professor Min, we'll start here then. Let's begin with your outlook on the future framework of Korea's diplomatic and security policies under the new Yun administration, that would be. Well, basically, I think that um, the next South Korean government is likely to strengthen the ROK U.S. alliance. And uh, it will also show a clearer position um, than its predecessor between U.S. and China. Uh, first, regarding the diplomatic position of the next South Korean government, um, the president-elect Yoon suk yeols campaign pledges show that um, the, his priority policy goal is to solidify the South Korea's status as a global pivotal country to contribute to freedom, peace, and prosperity based on dignified diplomacy and strong national security. And uh, concerning the, its relationship with the United States, the president-elect promised to reconstruct the ROK-US alliance and uh, strengthen the comprehensive strategic relationship with Washington by sharing the core values of democracy, market economy, and human rights. So the next South Korean government is expected to work closely together with the U.S. to stably maintain the security situation on the Korean Peninsula. And uh, to do that, uh, it will try to rebuild the combined defense posture with the U.S. and strengthen the ROK U.S. extended deterrence against the North Korea's nuclear threats. And uh, the next uh, South Korean government is likely to also like to strengthen its cooperation with the U.S. in relation to the U.S.-China strategic competition. So the president-elect campaign's pledges show that his government will participate in the vaccine, climate change, and emerging technology working groups under the Quad, and either also gradually join the 
pursue joining the Quad uh, as a formal member. So of all, it is expected that um, the next South Korean government will get closer to the United States than China in each overall positions between the two countries. All right. And Dr. Goh, as touched upon by Professor Min, mm. with regard to North Korea's ambitions for nuclear and military might, President-elect Yoon suk yeol has voiced a hardline stance. Mm. Do you care to elaborate on Yoon's stance as shared with the media thus far? Well, I think uh, when the media characterizes uh, President-elect Yoon's position as hardline, I think uh, the focus is a little bit uh, mistaken in the sense that the hardline doesn't mean that the president-elect Yoon is going to assume a very aggressive attitude uh, towards North Korea. It's m more about uh, buttressing the deterrence against North Korea's nuclear and missile threats. So in, in essence, it's all about building capability to counter the threats coming from North Korea. We know that uh, North Korea has advanced uh, its missile and nuclear programs uh, actually uh, uh, enormously in the last uh, two or three years. And uh, in a way, President-elect Yoon essentially is proposing to keep up with the level of threats. And I think, uh, as uh, Professor Min just mentioned, the issue, the, this buttressing of deterrence is going to, be, uh, going to be taking place within the framework of alliance with the United States. Uh, clearly, uh, the, the Biden administration is very eager to work with the President-elect Yoon uh, in order to essentially assume more uh, stronger deterrence posture against North Korea, especially in the light of recent developments, such as the announcement this morning that the North Korea had tested uh, ICBMs, essentially, in the guise of uh, satellite, uh, satellite launch uh, testing. So I think uh, uh, this is what it's going to be about, uh, but, uh, strengthening the deterrence, but not so much being aggressive uh, towards North Korea, and the diplomacy will always be on the table. Right. And Dr. Cronin, President Joe Biden and President-elect Yoon suk yeol spoke on the phone on Thursday just hours after the latter's win. What appears to be the response to Yoon's election victory within the diplomatic circle there in the U.S.? Well, as you can see from the president's conversation, uh, a very positive reaction from the White House. But I think this was also heard from uh, testimony from senior officials on Capitol Hill today and yesterday. Um, Dr. Eli Ratner, the Assistant Secretary of Defense yesterday, uh, Admiral Aquilino, uh, the U.S. Indo-Pacific Commander today, and uh, General LaCamera, the top U.S. Uh, uh, defense official in Korea, uh, all testifying and talking about the importance of the alliance with Korea um, and looking forward to working with a new democratically elected government uh, of, of Yoon suk yeol You know, he's not well known in, in general in, in the United mm -hmm. States yet. Um, but to the extent he is, it's, it's because he's adopted a very uh, positive approach to U.S. Uh, foreign policy, at, at least in terms of uh, superficially. Um, we'll have to see whether that is implemented, but it's, it's a very positive reaction at this point. Right. Meanwhile, Professor Min, let's mm. revisit the topic of Pyongyang's nuclear plans. What do you envision with regard to joint efforts by Seoul and Washington to address this challenge? Well, basically, I think that uh, we can find a uh, pretty good compatibility um, uh, in, in the two countries, North Korean policies. Uh, let me a little bit talk about the, uh, the uh, potential the North Korean policies of the next South Korean government. The campaign pledges of the president-elect show that his government will pursue complete and verifiable denuclearization of North Korea, and the South Korea will play um, central roles in international cooperation and uh, various negotiations for the denuclearization. And uh, to that end, the next South Korean government will have a predictable roadmap for the North Korea's denuclearization and maintain international sanctions on North Korea until the complete denuclearization process is achieved. And uh, however, it will open the possibilities for the economic aid if North Korea takes substantial denuclearization measures uh, before the denuclearization process is complete. Uh, in addition, it will also try to strengthen the trilateral cooperation among South Korea, U.S., and Japan to deal with the North Korean problems. So we can find that uh, South Korea and U.S., the two countries, the two countries' North Korean policies will be very close in how they will achieve their policy goal of the complete denuclearization of North Korea. So it is expected that South Korea and U.S. will work closely together to deal with the North Korean problems. Specifically, they will work together to strengthen the combined 
defense posture to deter North Korea's uh, provocations. And uh, they will also maintain economic sanctions on North Korea until the denuclearization process is complete. Meanwhile, they will continue to ask for North Korea to come back to the negotiating table. Right. And staying on the peninsula, Dr. Ko, North Korea on this Friday reported on Yoon's election mm. victory. Would you say this is an early report? I remember, do correct me if I'm wrong, back in the year 2007, I think Im myung baks victory was reported a week later. Exactly. I think uh, in the grand, uh, in the grand scheme of things, the report actually about uh, President-elect Yoon's uh, victory came out pretty early. I mean, it took uh, a day or so. So, but then on the other hand, uh, the news itself was actually very short. Uh, it was just two lines of a, a news, li uh, news headline, uh, not headline even, actually, very similar article, uh, actually stuck in a corner of the No Dong Shin Moon newspaper, uh, just you know, describing very plainly that uh, a conservative president, uh, Yoon Suk Yeol, had been elected in South Korea. So in that sense, I, I think North Korea is very taking, uh, very neutral stance, seemingly, but at the same time, a little bit dismissive in the sense that it's actually not treating this uh, as a major news item. But on the other hand, I think uh, uh, North Korea has been criticizing South Korea, not just President-elect Yoon, but President Moon and then the South Korean government for increasing, actually, uh, the deterrence measures against North Korea, as, uh, for example, developing new weapon systems and uh, uh, ex you know, uh, planning new joint military exercises with the United States. So I think uh, the tone of the uh, North Korean regime regarding the political situation in South Korea is already set. I think uh, uh, it also it's going to be in, uh, in sync with what's going on in terms of provocations by North Korea. North Korea has been uh, uh, carrying out more increasingly, more threatening uh, weapon system testings. And uh, I mean, this is a part of the roadmap that Kim Jong-un had announced uh, earlier this year, uh, which includes potentially a nuclear test. So in that sense, I think uh, there's no need on the, uh, for us to try to figure out whether North Korea is positively predisposed or negatively predisposed uh, to President elect Yoon because North Korea's roadmap for provocation is already set over this year. Right, so you do expect more acts of defiance, so to speak, in the near future? Yes. Right, Dr. Cronin, President-elect Yoon suk yeol has spoken about the importance of advancing trilateral ties among Seoul, Tokyo and Washington to address regional and, of course, broader international matters. Do you foresee constructive collaboration in the near future among these three nations? Hmm. Well, I hope so. That's music to the ears of Washington because uh, the United States is uh, allied with Japan and South Korea, and without both of them cooperating together, uh, were severely weak, weakened in terms of both deterring North Korea and managing a regional order generally, including vis-a-vis -vis China. So the fact that um, Yoon Sok Yeol is willing to state up front that he's willing to spend some political capital on shuttle diplomacy, on trying to bring about a better, more cooperative relationship trilaterally, uh, is exactly what we need. Uh, we need it because North Korea is acting up. Um, because uh, the global order is is at risk right now. We see that with uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, but the concern in the region about China's assertiveness in the future. So it's very important for these uh, three countries to be on uh, the same sheet of music. And I think uh, we may see this in May, just shortly after the inauguration, if President Biden is in the region, uh, maybe the three leaders will get together and, and reset this trilateral relationship. Right. Do you envision a uh, summit between President Biden and President-elect Yoon in May then? I certainly hope so in the latter half of May. You know, we have a war going on. Uh, there's a lot happening. But yes, I, I, I think this may happen. Right. Now, Professor Min, both Yoon and Kishida have acknowledged the importance of improving Seoul-Tokyo relations. But what are some of the variables, you suppose, that may hamper related efforts? Well, the, basically, the, um, the president-elect mentioned during the press conference yesterday that he want to build a future-oriented relationship with Japan. He said it is important to find out uh, what will be beneficial to both countries and their people in the future rather than in the past. And the uh, uh, Japanese prime minister congratulated Jun Song yeols election victory and also expressed expectations or hope for improving the relationship between the two countries. But, uh, but uh, it's, it's not still unclear whether the two countries or the two leaders will be able to uh, make a compromise the, over the, the long-standing historical and territory issues, such as the wartime forced labor and the comfortable women issues, 
Japan's claims on Dokdo Island and uh, Japan's recent push for the UNESCO um, the heritage designation of Southern Mai. Lots of issues going on there. And as you know, Japan has argued that all colonial era issues have been settled under the 1965 pact that normalized their bilateral relations. And Japan also argues that South Korea needed to, needed to first put forward a solution to the historical issues. But it's almost impossible, impossible for South Korea to accept such an unreasonable argument. In addition, it is expected that the Japanese government uh, will maintain its hardline stance against South Korea in the coming months to mobilize conservative voters in the upcoming the, um, up House election later this year. So personally, I hope that the two countries will find a creative solution that both of them and their people could accept. But I think that uh, still we got a long way to go. Right, there are mm. many huddles mm. on that road. And staying here in the region, Dr. Ko, what are your thoughts with regard to Seoul's uh, ties mm. with neighboring Beijing under the Yun administration? So I think it's going to be a very difficult situation uh, for uh, President-elect Yoon. Uh, yeah, it's a very zero-sum game-like situation for Korea. It's a great power competition between the United States and China, and they have a competitive demands on Korea in terms of foreign policy and economic ties. So what China is essentially saying is that if South Korea wants to continue good uh, trading relationship with China, then it means that South Korea would have to make compromises when it comes to its security environment and relationship with, alliance relationship with the United States. On the other hand, the United States uh, is very clear that uh, South Korea has to take a side, and then South Korea being a very democratic, uh, free market society, uh, the choice has to be obvious. Uh, it lies with the United States. Uh, so I think uh, when President-elect uh, New Nassim's office uh, this May, uh, and we will we'll be definitely uh, hosting uh, President Biden, hopefully, in May. Uh, but then I think uh, he'll also hear from the Chinese counterparts that uh, that uh, you know the South Korea has to be very clear about where is uh, I mean, where is position uh, when it comes to the great power competition between the major powers. I think uh, it's going to be a very different situation from say President Moon in the sense that President Moon, even though he agreed to uh, expand uh, the, the the South Korea's cooperation with the United States when it comes to Indo-Pacific strategy, didn't really take uh, concrete actions in that regard. Uh, but then. And I think a time's up pretty much. Uh, and I think a President Yoon, I, but then on the other hand, President Yoon made it very clear uh, what kind of direction it's going to take. And I think uh, that provides clarity. And that's the reason why the Biden administration is actually very content uh, with President uh, elect Yoon. Uh, in that sense, I think uh, the major risk will be for South Korea to manage a potential downside uh, with China uh, after uh, the new government uh, takes office. Right. And Dr. Cronin, what do you believe needs to be the priority for the incoming administration here in South Korea on the diplomatic front, keeping in mind the current climate of global affairs? Well, uh, you know, the enemy gets a vote, as we say, and uh, North Korea will be acting up. Uh, I expect the satellite launch uh, in April will effectively say that North Korea has uh, a Hwasong-17 ICBM, in effect, um, and that's what um, President-elect Yoon is going to inherit, I believe, after his inauguration. So his defense stance, which is very strong, including the resumption of uh, alliance military exercises, working on missile defenses, uh, building up defense modernization, all of those are going to be in the context of tense relations with North Korea. So that's going to be very important to coordinate with the United States, with Japan, um, and to get that right. The global economy is critical as well. Obviously, post-COVID, uh, if we are post-COVID, uh, you know, in terms of the economy, but now with the war, a Russia war against Ukraine, the energy uh, on top of inflation, these issues about the global economy, including uh, weaning ourselves off of uh, autocrats' oil and uh, making sure supply chain is secure, um, coming up with the technologies of the future, these are going to be critical uh, to coordinate, not just uh, domestically for Korea, but internationally and with allies like the United States. Right. You mentioned the war, Dr. Cronin. Speaking within your capacity as a scholar, do you believe Korea could do more, perhaps, to side with the U.S. and the West against Russia's invasion of Ukraine? Absolutely. Um, they've spoken out, which has been, uh, you know, we've seen that, we recognize it, but they can do more. Uh, they need to do more because global order is at stake. Uh, aggression cannot be allowed to pay. Even though it's in Europe, uh, it will affect Asian security as well.
Right, and keeping in mind what Dr. Cronin has said, Professor Min, what are your words of advice to ensure a smooth transition into a fresh framework of diplomatic and security policies under the incoming UN administration? Well, personally, I think that it could be inevitable for a new government to have different policy orientations from the predecessor. It's mainly because um, the, each leader and government has different uh, philosophy, norms, and principles to run the country. And the country is recognized as such policy changes uh, when their neighbor has a national election, and they are trying to um, the, uh, adapt themselves to the change the diplomatic situation based on their own national interest. So I think, personally, what the new government needs to do is to deliver its policy orientations to its uh, the diplomatic counterparts and to try to get their understanding and uh, support by consistently implementing the principle of diplomacy with the principle of diplomacy. So I hope that uh, the next South Korean government will actively communicate with uh, its uh, uh, diplomatic counterparts about its uh, policy orientations and make the uh, consistent diplomatic efforts to maintain good relationships with them, that yeah. uh, it's going to be okay. Right. And Dr. Go, what do you propose then to ensure a sense of consistency, as Professor Min said, with regard to North Korea yeah. policies? So definitely, I mean, consistency is very important. Uh, and then also we shouldn't you know, lose sight on our goal, which is the denuclearization of North Korea. I think North Korea, one, one thing that North Korea has been very consistent uh, was developing its nuclear program. And the level of threat coming from North Korea has only increased consistently uh, in the last uh, two decades. But then our policy has been over the map uh, in terms of uh, how to respond to the new threats. Sometimes we actually uh, minimize the, the perception of the threat. Uh, sometimes we actually try to somehow ignore it. But I think uh, by now it's very clear that uh, North Korea is only going to be more obsessed about its nuclear and missile programs. And in that sense, I think we should focus on uh, strengthening our deterrence against North Korea, while at the same time uh, trying the diplomatic venues as much as possible. Right, to ensure that dialogue remains on the table. Exactly. All right, Dr. Go, as always, thank you very much for your thoughts. And always Professor Min, here in the studio, thank you for your insights. And Dr. Cronin, over in the U.S., thank you very much for being with us at this very late hour at your end. Thank you. Right. Well, that brings us to the end of this week's editions of The Daily Report. We'll be back on Monday. Do join us then. Have a safe weekend.